thank you, Felice, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming out. I know it's a hectic time of year with the holidays. Um, so I just want to introduce myself. My name is Rebecca Madelon. I'm a curator here at the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston. Um, and I am absolutely honored and pleased to have Garrett Bradley here today. Um, she came from Rome to install this exhibition, and it's been a really wonderful few weeks, and we're just so pleased with the show and to have you here. I do just want to say that for those of you that maybe just arrived, um, the, all the works have sound, and we've muted them for this uh, conversation, so I absolutely encourage you to come back if you haven't gotten uh, to experience the, the works in all their glory. Um, so I'm going to begin just by giving a brief bio, which I'll read for Garrett, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty and talk for about 40 minutes and then open it up to questions. Okay. Garrett Bradley received her MFA from University of California, Los Angeles, and her BA from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Her short films and feature length projects have been exhibited internationally at museums and festivals, including the New Orleans Museum of Art, the 2019 Whitney Biennial, the J. Paul Getty Museum, the Sundance Film Festival, the Tribeca Film Festival, New York, uh, the Festival de Nouveau, uh, Nouveau Cinema Montreal, the Rotterdam Film Festival, South by Southwest, among many others. Bradley has received numerous awards and honors, including a 2019 through 20 Rome Prize from the Academy, uh, American Academy in Rome, Italy, which is where she's currently based for the next seven months. Um, so welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Thanks for having um, me. Uh, I thought that maybe we could uh, begin at the beginning, which is, um, I know that in, in high school, you spent a lot of time photographing concerts. And I'm wondering if you talk about just a little bit how you got into filmmaking. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I was always really interested in watching movies. And um, I kind of came to filmmaking because I got a camcorder. I got my hands on a camcorder. My stepdad had given me one for Christmas. And I was in a Quaker high school at the time and was lucky enough to have, they had editing equipment, which now is like very antiquated. It was like these big pieces of hardware. Um, and I made a film about my parents, actually. Um, and my teacher had encouraged me to submit it to the Quaker Film Festival, which I did. And it won like a little award. And I think it was the first time I felt like I was good at something. Um, that I was sort of validated and I felt like I had really found a language, um, not in any way that was trained at that point at all. And then when I was in college, I continued to make little films and um, one of my professors, Abraham Rabbit, who's also a filmmaker, um, sort of introduced me to a lot of um, Sam Brackage and sort of a history of experimental filmmaking and I learned how to shoot on film and was able to use a flatbed. Um, but I still had not been sort of formally trained in terms of the, the sort of traditional practices of, of filmmaking. So I did end up going to graduate school at UCLA to learn that and spent about two years making little films that were really, the UCLA program was very, as I think a lot of film, graduate film programs are in the directing department, very oriented towards storytelling mm -hmm. and narrative and sort of, um, you know, um, coverage and how to really construct traditional films that we see. And I had an opportunity to meet um, Willie Bud Wood M Billy Woodbury, who was a, became a mentor to me and was a part of sort of the Black Rebellion movement that happened in the 60s, which was neorealist cinema that was happening in California during the 1960s. And Julie Dash was a part of it. And Charles Burnett was a part of it. Um, and so I really became more aware at that point of a sort of cinematic trajectory and, and saw myself working within that in a more conscious way at that point. Um, and I think from that point forward, I just continued to make films and, um, and probably in the vein of that neorealist sort of approach of working with non-professional actors in exterior settings with, um, that were loosely based off of reality. <laughs> that didn't have much story structure. You know, I think that was always a challenge for me in school. Um, or the way we traditionally understand narrative yeah. or documentary to yeah. take place as a, a sequence of events. Yeah, which is not to put it down. I mean, I, I, I love that. And I also still work in that space as well. But 
certainly I think the beginning of my entry point into that was um, very self-conscious about my inability to do that and frankly just as I got older I was because I wasn't actually interested in it <laughs> as was it much. part of the program at UCLA or was that more just what you got from it? I think it was part of the program. I think that there was a really there was a real emphasis on how, if there are two people sitting at a, at a table and they're having a conversation how do you shoot that and working within a specific formula of, of how that works. And I actually think that there's a huge amount of value in understanding that and learning that. And, um, but I think I was actually more interested in a different kind of process. I was, I was still trying to figure out my own visual language. And, and I think that my resistance to that actually is, was probably a good thing because it, it allowed me to find myself in a certain kind of way. And had I not been in a more formal setting, I may not have, have understood that about myself, maybe. That makes me, um, I wonder if that might be a good way to shift towards talking about your, your process more generally. You know, you mentioned that um, you're often not using professional actors, you're using um, often the communities or um, looking on Craigslist or mm -hmm. um, word of mouth through friends and family. Yeah. Um, you're, you know, also um, uh, thinking about a way of making that isn't necessarily um, determined by like a, a, a predetermined idea of what a film is mm -hmm. going to be, um, but much more so thinking about um, narrative and, and, and story coming through conversations. And I, wish, I wonder if you could talk about that in yeah. general. Is that the way that you've always worked? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll start off by saying it's just thinking about graduate school now. It's funny because I think that there was a challenge for me of starting with a story. I think that was always, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. I couldn't be like, okay, well then like they meet each other and then like this thing happens and then like, and then it's the end, you know? Like I was always more interested, I think, in questions. Um, and I think all of my work, um, particularly America and AKA here in this show, really started off with me being interested in, um, in America, just sort of a, a missing archive and the things that we don't know about with AKA looking at certain um, forms of, uh, certain parts of sort of American cinema that were dealing with race relations and gender relations and asking questions about their relevance to the present moment. And m rather than constructing uh, the answer to that, I've always wanted to look outward and to go into, to ask other people what their thoughts were on that and to sort of really facilitate conversation actually first and foremost. That's kind of, kind of how I see myself as, as a facilitator. And then the answers that come out of those conversations um, usually then inform the, the, the way in which the film looks and the sort of general approach to the work. And so I actually, now that I'm talking about it in this way, don't know if I ever get to the answer. <laughs> but um, maybe that's what's also interesting about it, or it may, maybe it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. So how does, how does this, the process for you work? If you're talking about um, like what kinds of questions, clearly it's based on the, the project that you're working on, but um, how long is that stage? And, and yeah. you know, what, what you're looking online, but you're looking for friends as well. You know, you're, yeah. you're thinking about um, ways of avoiding the more traditional um, structures for way films are made. A casting agent, you know, you talked right, about how yeah. um, early on, you know, you had approached a casting agent and they were like, haha, no, you don't <laughs> have the money and this project isn't big enough. Yeah. And it became, you know, I wonder how much um, it began as out of necessity yeah. and has become really a kind of working model for you. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, it, yes. So when I first moved to New Orleans in 2010, Benjamin Button was getting shot. And I remember being was like, filmed there? it was, yeah, partially, okay. yeah. And I remember, especially coming right out of UCLA, I was like, cool, I'm going to get a casting director. I'm going to like get a producer. I'm going like, to find all these things, you know? And they were like, we're shooting Benjamin Button. Like, no, thank you, you know? <laughs> and so then, yeah, I went to Craigslist um, because also the, the film I was making at the time, which was my first feature, was inspired by experiences of me taking Greyhound buses between New York and New Orleans and meeting people who were my age who were very much not a part of sort of the public conversation and popular culture um, of, of how my generation, I felt like, was being depicted. Um, and so it was important for me to, 
create, document, um, and create a narrative around what I actually saw and what I actually felt represented our experience um, in its diversity. And so Craigslist also, for that reason, became a sort of intuitive place to go to because I essentially just um, was looking for people whose lives were closely resembling or relating to the people I, I had originally met on those trips. Um, and I spent about three to four months in a cafe and people would just come in and I'd just sit and talk with them. And it kind of just ended up boiling down to who actually showed up, <laughs> who was consistent, who I felt like we had a mutual level of vulnerability and trust with. And I think that in the process of making that film, so much of working with people who are not used to being on camera, um, is it, it's a lot of, it's kind of like therapy and it's a lot of um, confidence building and it's a lot of, um, you know, allowing somebody to trust you and for you to trust them. And it's a very different, and, to, and for their personal experiences to be thought of for themselves as an asset and not something that is keeping them back. Um, and when you start to make work that way, that's about something that's chronic or something that's universal, it actually is an amazing way of building a community. Um, and so I think had I not, and I've continued to work that way for that reason. Um, AKA was also cast through people who I'd met on Instagram, um, family members, friends, friends of friends, um, and having mothers and daughters sit down and have conversations about their relationship with each other, their relationship with themselves, how they see themselves in relationship to love, to the workforce and, and, and upward mobility, and the differences that they both felt that they had as a result of their skin tone. Um, and yeah, and so it, it's, again, it's not really for me so much that it's a better uh, method than, for instance, hiring actors. It's just a very different um, process, and it's one that I think I intuitively go to really kind of as sort of the form, sometimes in some cases as the form of research for more mainstream things that will then eventually develop into theatrical films that where there are actors that are hired. Um, so with AKA, for instance, it was sort of this reverse approach where I was really interested in making an adaptation of a classic film, and I had tried to just kind of put a pitch deck together, which is sort of just this like really fancy looking PDF <laughs> <laughs> with a lot of pictures and, and writing and uh, references and, um, and sort of pitching them to production companies, and it just felt really hollow, and I really, it was this bizarre kind of coming to Jesus moment of feeling the way I felt in graduate school of being like, I don't know how to start with the story. Like, I don't know how to just start here. And so I went, I was like, I need to understand why this is relevant to anybody right now, what I'm doing. And a way to do that was to engage people in the way that I did with AKA. And so I created a sort of really just research or a series of tests that became, which is what this is. Um, and it sort of became its own thing, but maybe uh, will also inform something that's a bit more mainstream down the line. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaks interestingly. As you mentioned, you th really think of yourself as a facilitator, but this idea of a kind of um, uh, a really ethical approach or um, a kind of social engagement as a form of research, because I think we can talk about research in all different kinds of ways. You know, mm -hmm. for um, America, you also spent uh, a large amount of time in the um, Library of Congress, looking at the Black Film Archives. Yeah. Um, but then there's this other kind of research that isn't, um, that's less about the way we think of like reading and writing and digging through things and more mm -hmm. about um, listening or yeah. um, committing to people and really letting um, their stories lead you. Yeah. Um, which I think is, yeah. is, is a really interesting approach. But I guess I also, you know, thinking about what you talked about, which is this interesting way in which um, you are working uh, both in a kind of traditional commercial film world and in uh, a museum or institutional world and mm -hmm. um, thinking about the way um, I'm, or I'm wondering if you could talk about the way those those two circles or those two fields um, impact each other or you know you mentioned that through having this um, so AKA was first installed in the Whitney Biennial and um, it provided you an opportunity to, to, to move backwards. So you had this idea of a traditional film that you wanted mm -hmm. to make, but in order to get there, to begin to think about it, you actually wound up creating something that existed or now exists in a very different way and kind of the 
art world. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about your approach in each of these contexts, like what it, what it means to kind of work between these, mm -hmm. these two worlds. I mean, of course, there are examples of other artists who, mm -hmm. who, who do this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Steve McQueen would be one example. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there are a lot more, to some degree, Julie Dash as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, Shireen, I wonder, I yeah, like, yeah, yeah, Shireen the shot. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if, um, even like, even if it's the struggles or the difficulty of it, yeah. or not knowing how they differ, or if you don't distinguish between them, but yeah. like, what is it like to work within these institutional frames? <gasps> it's these crazy. Frames? No, I think it is crazy. Actually, I don't know. I mean, I'm in it, so it's hard to sort of step outside of it and dissect it in a certain kind of way. I think that there is just a lot of, um, it's a, it's a, sh it actually, it's, it's not really any different than the beauty of directing in and of itself, which is that for me, I think the role of a director is somebody who um, is a leader and the way that they lead is by, um, is through compassion and through the ability to speak multiple languages. So the way that, so that essentially you have one vision and you may be working with 100 people, every single one of those people speaks a different language depending on what their role is on set, where they're coming from, who they are, and being able to communicate to them in a way that they can understand what the vision is, but also feel a level of autonomy to do what they think is right and to essentially join in on this sort of communal effort. Um, and so I think working between both spaces is kind of not any different, it, it's sort of, Sometimes your language changes, the way that you talk about something changes, the way that you propose a project changes. Um, the process sometimes is also different um, in, in the making of it. Uh, you know, just being on set with, for instance, a union crew is very different than being uh, with seven people, you know, on the side of a highway with a, with a tripod. It's, um, it's different. It's all kind of, it's all, it's all about energy and language and and frankly, just how we probably should exist in the world of just um, shifting in a way that's in response to what's in front of you, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I guess maybe this would be a good opportunity to dig into America a little bit more, talking mm -hmm. about shifting in general. It's the first work you've made that is, um, has, in terms of its formal composition, yeah. has a sculptural quality to it. You're working. Yeah. Um, in an in installation-based way for the first time. Yeah. And I should say that America also exists uh, as a single channel work that you show at screenings. Mm -hmm. It's a different cut. Um, and I, I wonder if you want to talk about like what made you want to realize the work in a kind of sculptural or yeah. dimensional capacity that um, would involve a spatial installation. Yeah. So America, for those of you who don't know, I'll just sort of briefly, it's a long story, but I'm gonna keep it kind of brief. It's, um, it's, it's a visual chronology starting in 1915, going through 1926. So it's a series of 12 vignettes that are um, illustrating an individual or moment in time that is less known. Um, and that is also in celebration, not just a black life, but is sort of making a case for the intersection and the, the inability to separate black, black cinema from American cinema. Um, and so thinking about it as a chronology, I had always actually envisioned it being something that needed to be moved through, something that was physical, um, but also something that was dealing with transparency as a way of sort of collapsing time. I think part of what really inspired the project was in 2013, the Museum of Modern Art found um, this film that they titled Lime Kin Club Field Day. And it was a series of unassembled outtakes from a film that had been made in 1913, so 100 years prior, starring Burt Williams. And part of what was so significant about it was that they think it's the first feature length film with an all black cast and integrated production. So it was really significant. Several years after Plessy versus Ferguson, which was sort of the beginning of Jim Crow, um, also the same year that the modern day projector was invented, so technology was allowing people to come together for the first time. Um, it was really significant that you saw white people and black people working together to make something creative that was also, when you look at the footage, pretty progressive in terms of technically speaking, but also in terms of the way uh, people are depicted. Um, and seeing Showing intimacy and, between intimacy. a man and a woman, a middle class life. Yeah, leisure. Yeah, leisure, pleasure. Um, pleasure. Um, 
And so at the bottom of this article, when I was reading about it in the newspaper, the Library of Congress had done this survey that 70% of the films made between 1912 and 1929, we don't have any more missing because they deteriorated, deteriorated. Most of them were made out of nitrate. The studios threw out a lot of silent films once talking films came in. Um, and so the fact that they found this one film in 1913 that was super progressive was to me a gr this amazing opportunity to think about um, filling a gap of 7,500 films with work that was sort of evoking the spirit of this source material that was equally as progressive. Um, and so that's why I was thinking in terms of a chronology. It was like, how can I fill that gap? How can I create a body of work that is evoking that same spirit that I saw in the source material? Um, and so it wasn't so much about, I want to make something physical or I want to do something different. It really, the, 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 I, the concept was asking for something that was, um, that was physical and that could be moved through and that part of you know, I was working with Pierre Briette, who's here, who, you know, installs the show with me every time. And he and I work together really closely to think about, like, how can we, how can we take this analogy of, like, your hand being in front of your face, right? When, it, and you can't, when your hand is really close to your face, you can't really see what it is. The further you get away from it, it becomes more and more clear, and you understand the context for it, and that history and time is very much the same way, that when we're in the present moment, it's kind of harder to understand what it is. And the further we are from it, the more we can understand the relationship between all these things. How can we create a structure that, that indicates that, um, that, that metaphor? And moves away way. from a kind of linearity or like yeah. the way we traditionally think about history or time, which is being like one narrative and yes. this idea of a kind of multiplicity of moments of simultaneity, of horizontality right. versus like singularity. Right, yeah. exactly, which is a really big, I mean, which is a challenge with any sort of film making in general, you can only tell a story one frame at a time, you know? Which is also just goes to show the beauty of, of traditional cinema when you don't even realize you, how much you're getting just at these, in these quick clips. One clip at a time is what builds an entire world and narrative and that's the beauty of editing and the beauty of shooting actually in the way that I was taught at UCLA. Um, but I find it can also be, it poses very interesting challenges and questions. Um, as you say, about what's linear and, and, and how to create context one frame at a time. Um, yeah, so that's the first attempt at, at that. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because you talked about, you know, um, the way that you were engaging this kind of archival material. So I should say, if you haven't seen it, um, uh, America includes both new sh newly shot uh, scenes, performances, as well as interspersed with um, original footage from Lime Kiln, and often in this footage, which you sort of allude to, is um, that the work was never finished, and it exists as sort of a series of un unassembled outtakes. So you can very much see, um, you know, uh, cue cards and the sort of indication mm -hmm. to the actual making of a film. There's a kind of transparency towards um, yeah. to production, and you're also again sort of rupturing by bringing together new performances that, even though they're in black and white and shot on 35 millimeter film, um, there isn't necessarily a, a, a pretense to making them look as if they're aged, mm -hmm. you know, unlike other people who sort of, you know, feign a kind of um, treatment to make footage look old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you so interestingly talk about um, the way that it's not only an engagement of an archive and a sort of a proposal or a fabrication of a, of a missing archive, but also very much the construction of an archive for the future, which is that you're capturing these communities mm -hmm. as they exist in, in New Orleans. And I'm wondering if you could yeah. talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, no, thank you for reminding me of that. So we, I'll, I guess I'll say that within the context of the first vignette, um, which starts in 1915, and we see a white sheet go from being a KKK costume to just sort of a mundane bedsheet that we see on a clothing line to a white flag, which is then sort of reclaimed by the Buffalo Soldiers, which is a historically black social aid and pleasure club that's been around since the turn of the century that's active in New Orleans, and there's many chapters throughout the country. Um, and I wanted to start in 1915 because in my research, it was sort of alluded to that Birth of a Nation, which came out in 1915, which was sort of the resurgence of the KKK, was part of the reason why 
the producers pulled out of Limekin Club Field Day. Part of the reason why that film wasn't finished was that they felt it, it was too progressive, it wasn't commercially viable enough. So I liked the idea of picking up there with the series and then thinking about how the white sheet could be uh, could change its meaning depending on how it's assembled and who's holding it. And um, we also then the next year, 1916, Woodrow Wilson established the Boy Scouts of America, and that's not has doesn't overtly have anything to do with blackness or black America, but that's also why I thought what a great opportunity to reinsert new iconography into that history. Um, so each one of these years also gave, and so, sorry, going back to, to your question though, the Boy Scouts, a lot of the kids were students of mine at the Sojourner Truth Community Center. They are Boy Scouts. You know, the Buffalo Soldiers are Buffalo Soldiers. We, you know, there's a moment with the blacksmiths uh, later on, which is a, a, was a huge industry in New Orleans at one point. Um, so it is, yes, hearkening to an archive that's missing, while also creating a new archive and documentation of communities and, and activities that are happening in the current moment as well. Um, which I think is part of the beauty, going back to just what it means to not necessarily work with actors, you know? You are also, you're creating an archive, you know, in that process as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, you know, it's so interesting the way that you talk about your work and thinking about engaging these existing communities, you know, and not, um, you know, really finding a way to tell stories that are based on, on specific people and specific places mm -hmm. and, um, you know, very much tying uh, this idea of the everyday um, to actual actual people mm -hmm. um, who exist in the world, who are maybe enacting what their everyday lives mm -hmm. are like. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I have some like very basic questions, which is like, how? What is the scale of, the, of this kind of production? You know, who mm. like you are. Um, how do you go about engaging or finding people? I mean, clearly you're talking about looking on Craigslist, but then there are also these very specific communities that you're seeking out mm -hmm. and what that process is like and, um, you know, yeah. how, how often, you know, you also talk about, like, and you're talking about yourself as a facilitator, like, how often do you have to convince people to, to trust you, you know, yeah. to, to act themselves? Because I feel like so often you're actually acting, asking people to be themselves, yeah. which is, uh, you know, uh, asking a lot sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's such a well put question. And I, first, I guess I should just say that I, I have not really had to convince people ever to work on something. Can't but it's that charming. No, I think it's, I think it's because I'm, I'm coming at it without uh, an, an idea, first and foremost. I have, I think, coming, uh, Huey Copeland, I think, put it really well, which is that when you are including people in the process of questions and developing answers, it sort of subverts the whole idea of sort of the auteur filmmaker and it allows for this level of co-direction and I think that that's always where I come from and so I think people can read through bullshit and if they believe you they believe you and if they don't they don't and I've been fortunate enough for people to, to trust that process and to really to really give themselves to it. Um, the way in which I've met folks I mean just in terms of like the first film with Alone which was made in 2017, I met Lon through Desmond, who I met on Craigslist in 2010, who was in Below Dreams. Um, which is the first feature that you worked on and what yeah. brought you to New Orleans. Yes, exactly. And I became really close with his girlfriend. Um, and when he was arrested and sitting in a private prison for a year and a half awaiting trial, um, and I kind of bore witness to what that experience was and it was a very new thing for her. This is this is not anything she had any experience with. And we made this film together and it was very much about, um, number one, understanding in terms of, again, the scale of a production, understanding what her routine is, what her life is, and her understanding what parts of that were important for the story. And that's part of where the control of the of the camera work comes in, which is that it isn't about just saying, cool, can I be with you for like everywhere you are for a month? I'm not interested in doing that. It's more like, how can I understand you and what you do every day and then choose really specific moments that we that I know how to anticipate. So I know where my camera needs to be because I know that you're gonna be on the phone for the next six hours. And so my camera's gonna be there. And I don't need to be with you between, you know, the car and you know, your house and your work. That's, that's not a part of the story, you know. So really being able to 
understand somebody's life so that you are essentially curating these frames kind of from the beginning. And then Lon, um, so that's how that film came to fruition, um, was through that relationship that started in 2010. Um, America, we had probably 100, if not more, cast members. Um, I think it was about a 20-person crew. And because we're shooting on film, it just required a different level of support. A lot of it we were shooting on a sound stage that kind of felt like this in some ways. Um, in the middle of the summer with no air conditioning, which was not fun. Um, and so a lot of them, as I said, were students of mine. Um, Lon is in the film. Her kids are in the film. Um, people I just knew, Donna Crump and Edward Spots, I actually met through my sister-in-law, um, who knew them both. Um, and I thought, you know, they're classically trained ballet dancers from New Orleans and knew each other already and created a really interesting parallel between the, the sort of love chase that we see in the archive with Burt Williams and Odessa Gray. Um, and with AKA, um, Lon is not in AKA, but some of her friends are. Um, and that was, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of that was also just through like finding people on Instagram, like um, here's a series of questions, do they resonate with you? Would you be interested in being in a film? First by talking about them openly and then having it develop into a film. I always show the work to people before it goes out into the world. Um, I often show them, you know, I mean, I think even just the presence of a camera, especially when you're working with a big camera and you're working with young people, I always give them an opportunity to look at the camera and to touch the camera. Um, when I'm shooting, I tell people what lens we're on, not, that, not to say like, hey, we're on a 50 millimeter lens. That means that like, this is what's on camera. You know, um, you don't need to worry about anything else if you don't want to. And sometimes just saying that gives people a, a, a sense of confidence of, of just knowing what's going on, you know? Um, the actual, uh, I guess, part of it, AKA, was also in, in the questioning. I, I mean, I remember asking, one of the consistent questions was if you had to uh, illustrate your relationship with your mom or with your daughter in a still image, what would that image look like? And so the poses that you see them in uh, throughout the film are what their answers were um, in front of their own homes. And so that's not something I could have written, you know? Um, that's something that they kind of directed, you know? So much of the kind of and I think you talked about this, that like the location, the fact that where they wanted to be yeah. outside their home, what they wanted to be doing, very much was an emanation of what they were interested in yeah. doing, that it wasn't based on a kind of predetermined idea of what a mother and daughter should look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so interesting. It's funny, I want to go back to um, you mentioning that the two sort of leads in America, Donna and Edward, are dancers and choreographers. Mm -hmm. I actually think that's incredibly interesting that you would make that decision, thinking about um, both sort of formally and conceptually how much the work itself has to do with movement. I mean, mm -hmm. you described um, this sort of beginning scene in which the, the, the sort of whole narrative sort of um, starts off by the propulsive movement of this uh, white sheet, which mm -hmm. moves from a Klansman's cloak to a bed sheet to a flag. You know, we also have very early on your inclusion of one of the original scene, the scenes from Lime Kiln, mm -hmm. which is uh, Burt Williams and Odessa Warren Gray, the female lead, mm -hmm. um, riding around circularly on a uh, merry-go-round, yeah. which I think also you think about the way that a viewer engages this work spatially, which is also moving around it. Yeah. Um, so I wonder uh, if you could talk more about the decision to to cast people who are maybe more more trained or yeah. sensitive to the way that um, bodies can be utilized. Yeah, that's in well, space. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I really wanted to. I was thinking about uh, what it would mean to make a contemporary silent film, and um, you know, the soundscape is is really important, which we can talk about, but. Uh, a part of that was the physicality. You know, when you watch a lot of silent films, the physicality of, of the performance is so important. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that they, we, you know, back in the day, the lenses were so, the cameras were such that they had to be in one place and you had to be really far away. And so performances needed to be legible uh, when you couldn't be as close. And so I was interested in like, what would, you know, storytelling from a physical standpoint is a key part of thinking about silent cinema. Um, and I really came at it I mean, I would talk to them about each one of these vignettes in really simple terms, you know, in terms of like emotion, like one word, 
and then I would allow they I would just say please interpret that the way that you want to together and they worked together in an amazing way and then like they'd be like okay I'll show you this like check this out and like they do this amazing thing and I'd be like sweet like these are the like camera we can see from here to there like go for it you know and they um, they just totally they they brought that you know to the film and I learned a lot uh, in watching them work together and in um, and in the process of having to learn how to communicate with dancers which was also a first thing time for me sometimes I'd say things and they'd be like what the fuck are you talking about I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> and you know and that's also like just what happened that's why being a director I think is really you know um, you you your confidence sometimes comes from your ability to be understood and to be clear and if people are like I don't know what you're talking about then that's really on you you have to find a way to get people to understand what you're saying um, and so there were times where they didn't know what I was saying and I had to learn and I had to evolve my own language you know and way of thinking yeah and I feel like that so interesting points to again back to this idea of working with people being a facilitator whether that's for your own ideas or getting them to move the way you want or mm. to produce what what you're looking for yeah you know, I think that's it's such a um, uh, an ethical and generous way of of working yeah I guess um, maybe one more question then we can open it up to the audience but Thinking about ethics, we were having this conversation when you first arrived. Um, so you work in a way which is you're often both realizing your own films commercially and in the art world, and then sometimes you're hired mm -hmm. to, to direct something. Mm -hmm. So on a project that you're working on, you were talking about um, sort of negotiating with producers or editors um, who were attempting to depict uh, violence against black men mm -hmm. um, through the use of footage of police brutality um, or um, you were thinking about police brutality or the militarization of the police in the 90s and they were sort of continuing to use footage of black men being assaulted mm -hmm. and I think one of the really interesting things that we've talked about is um, what it means to reframe that because what you've been trying to do is to move away from this sort of perpetuation of these sort of stigmatized um, the sort of victimization of you know, the continuation of violence against black mm -hmm. men and thinking about no like we should be focusing on the bodies of these police officers mm -hmm. there are other ways of telling this story and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. You know, I know that you and Huey talked about this. He talks about that in relation to Arthur Jaffa, mm -hmm. um, who I think either just made or is working on a work um, that includes footage from the uh, Manuel AME church massacre in which he, you know, um, is just using footage, I think, of the gunman Dylan Roof and not of the sort of violence against black bodies. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, I mean, it's especially heightened in a more commercial space um, where it, it's, it's sort of like having to, like, for lack of a better phrase, really decolonize our eyes and way of, of telling stories, which is that it makes sense intuitively, actually, to say, well, here's examples of the things that were done or of the things that happened. Um, but we don't actually realize that in the process of doing that, we are constantly in something that I, I've, I came to realize how to articulate, I think, a bit better, which is that I always assume that whatever I'm showing somebody, particularly young people, they are going to take that as the truth. They are going to take that as the standard. Um, and I never, and so if we think about it that way, we start to become more careful about what we want people to remember and how we want people to understand what the truth is. Um, and so it's really about kind of reversing the perspective, you know? And in that particular case, yeah, the focus for me was also let's look at the cops and their training versus their victims. Um, let's just switch this around a little bit. And I think, I mean, that, that's a whole other kind of, I think, super interesting conversation that does also go back to understanding traditional structures, construction of of cinema, 
which is that, um, and how we understand perspective and how we understand who our lead characters are, um, you know, and who we're supposed to be seeing from and who we're supposed to be empathizing with. Um, there was a film I can't remember that I watched a few years ago during Christmas that was about, um, uh, uh, it was like a sort of like Indian and cowboy film, right? And it was supposed to be uh, somehow, it was advertised as being like this film that was like compassionate to that experience, uh, to the other experience and not being sort of overly emphasized and sort of being like inherently, um, inherently white. And, and yet when you watched it, you, there were never any scenes with the Native American characters where there wasn't a white character, right? So there were no pieces of dialogue that existed. They didn't exist independently. Yeah, they didn't exist independently yeah, didn't of exist. this main character. Yeah. And so that's, a, and that's just something we need to think about as we start to make films. I think it's so ingrained in the process that, that we really don't even realize at times that what we're doing. And so it's, I think I always come from the place of, it isn't about blaming people actually, and it isn't even about, it's really just about um, thinking about how number one, beauty can also be just as proactive, I think, as trauma. Um, and, and also just saying, let's like rethink, like it's only 120 years old, like we can continue to evolve the practice and rethink it. And it's just now we're at a point where we, well, we've been at a point where we need to just be thinking differently about where the camera is, <laughs> yeah. what we're repeating, yeah. Um, you know, I also, I just love that like you still believe that, you know, visual culture has an integral role to play in the way that we can reframe or rethink um, ideas of representation that, you know, that there are other possibilities, other yeah. ways, and that it's not just a, a you know, a, a weapon for, you know, emptying black bodies of subjectivity, but a, a tool for reimagining what, yeah what, you know what totally. we want to see totally <laughs> yeah thank you um, <laughs> thank you um should we open it up to questions i don't know if anybody has any over there sure yeah i'm question. um Working on a few things right now. <laughs> One of them, um, actually, so when I was making Alone, uh, there's a woman at the end of the film who uh, makes an analogy between slavery and the prison industrial complex. And I initially, Alone initially was going to be a series of conversations that were facilitated between Lon and other women who were. Um, of a who were often older and had gone through this experience for a longer period of time, who could who could give her advice on what to do. And I, I reached out to an organization called Flick in New Orleans, which is Friends and Families of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children. And um, you know, the film obviously ended up being something different, but I did keep that piece in there. And I, I the woman, her name is Fox Rich, and I um, she robbed a bank with her husband in the 90s. And uh, when I had met her, had been fighting to get her husband out. He'd been given a numerical life sentence at Angola. Um, and she'd been fighting for 18 years to get him out at that point. Um, and I was really interested in her because she was dealing with something that Lon was about to potentially enter, which was what it means to, to love somebody who you have, don't have access to for who knows how long. Um, but she was maneuvering through the system in a really different way. And she was learning about the bureaucracy of that system in a really different way than, than Lon was. Um, and that was mostly just because she'd been in it for so long. But it, it struck me as, because Alone had done relatively well, and I became more and more sort of skeptical of this idea that this film would somehow represent in a singular way what the experience was for women dealing with this issue. And I, you know, I, I think that, as Steve McQueen said, actually, when he made 12 Years a Slave, there's so many films that can be made out of this one time period. There's so many films that can come out of one issue. It doesn't have to be one thing that represents all of it. And so I started making this film with Fox because I felt like it was important to create an alternative, or, or parallel, rather, experience to something that was similar. Um, and so that turned into a, a feature-length film. And actually, the last day that we were shooting with her, 
She gave me 21 years worth of um, home videos that she'd been shooting of herself while he was gone, oftentimes talking to him directly and also just documenting her family with the idea that he would see them. Um, and so it was another way to also approach archive again, um, this time without knowing that it had existed at all. Um, and so that will, that's coming out next year. Um, and yeah, I've just been uh, kind of, AKA is something that I want to continue to develop um, with, with other women, um, maybe in other parts of the world even. Um, so it all is generative and <laughs> building off of itself. I'd like to sleep too. I think I'm going to sleep a lot. <laughs> That's a goal. You know, you, you just mentioned that you said alone, you felt did relatively well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what do you mean by well? And like, what, what are your measures of success for projects? Mm. It's a good. It's a really good question because I. Um, well, the, what I was referencing was that it, it won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. It was shortlisted for an Oscar. It got a lot of press. Um, did that necessarily make it successful to me? No, which is also why I wanted to make another film you know, that was dealing with this. Um, I also felt that in the process of those campaigns and, and really getting a, a first look at what, what that means to, to move through a film in that way, Sometimes it becomes very focused on the director and on the filmmaker and, and really separate from what the film is about um, and the complexity of where films are available and how they can be seen and how they're reaching the people that the films are about. There's a lot of work to be done to connect those dots. And so um, what I meant was that it was successful in these very specific ways. Um, but. And, and the sad part is that you do also need those things, right, in order to continue to make the work. So it's not a matter of dismissing them. Um, they're very necessary and can be really fun, too. Um, but it's complicated. Yeah. What was your second question again? Um, I can have two more now. But OK, the second mm. question was, um, you know, in America, you mentioned that it's, it's 12 vignettes that assemble together as like a chronology. One of them in the S is a scene where it's basically like a silhouetted scene mm. with the fabric in front of it, and your characters are on the on one side of the screen and the other side. Yeah. Because because I don't know if you'll ever be able to explain every scene in the film, but yeah. could you explain that one, or could you talk about what period in time that scene is about? And yeah, I've seen it multiple times, and in this version, the installation there seems to be like additional shots. Oh yeah, there probably are. Yeah. And, uh, yeah just can you talk about it. Yeah, I think you're referring to the Boy Scouts yeah. section, um, which was 1916, which is when Woodrow Wilson established the Boy Scouts of America. And it's funny because the, the concept for that for me was really about just the beauty of order and routine and having a leader showing you how to put your hat on. They're all wearing Black Panther hats. And, and so, so sort of subverting, again, this idea of what what that whole legacy is, but having, you know, seen them tie their bows, and which I just was, I loved watching when we were, when I was teaching them, you know, because they are Boy Scouts, and I just was like, this is adorable, number one, and, and I, love, I love the routine, and I wanted to experiment with that. It, it felt actually very cinematic to me. Um, and then Imagine That is, which we see her holding a sign that says Imagine That, and it's a game um, where you, you choose one object and you try to do as many different things with that one object as you can. So like, this could be like a telephone, it could be something you're drinking from, it could be a hat, it could be, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a weird game. Um, and so formally, I was, we took a bunch of painter's plastic and created a frame around it and then painted it. Um, as if it were like in a garden, which to me was just thinking about, I think of the Boy Scouts as being in sort of this idyllic woodsy area, which we don't necessarily have in, in the heart of New Orleans. Um, and actually their shadows were a mistake. We, it was really hard to shoot because they, they, when, you, when you have a certain amount of distance, they become silhouettes. And um, so and it was really hard to get, to get the kids to just be like, it's also really hot. And it was like, get closer to the plastic, get closer to the plastic, I can't see you. And eventually we just had everyone come out on the other side of the plastic, which is why you have two different yeah. shots. Um, so it was a total, 
mistake. And I think that the silhouetting, I mean, a lot of people, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, it harkens to other things as well. And I, it wasn't necessarily something I intentionally wanted to do or say. And so I think having that balance was really important in the cut. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe one more question? Oh, yeah. 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 right there. Um, I was, I've been watching all the videos and I noticed that you have, each video has a particular type of soundtrack. Um, mm -hmm. For example, this is very sweet and very um, drone-like. And the other one has a very nice melody. Um, mm -hmm. How do you go about selecting your music? Uh, are you thinking about it beforehand or is it created after? Um, that's a really good question. So with Alone, actually, I um, was listening to this Max Roach song called Mbop from an album of his in the 70s. That's kind of a weird album. But I was, and he's working with, um, I think, the marimba. Um, and I, was, I just listened to it over and over and over again and constructed all the shots in my head, wrote them out, and then we shot them. And then I was like, so this is the score, guys. And like, they were like, no, it's not. <laughs> we're actually not using this. And they really pushed me to think about a different kind of score that was less sort of monotonous. And I you know, wanted, I think, for any young filmmakers out there, I think it is important, even if you do have a really clear vision of what you want, there's also something to be said for listening and, and pushing yourself sometimes when people are suggesting other things. And so I did that. And um, I ended up working with an amazing composer, Jonathan Zablin, who brought in strings actually and so the I, so that conversation started off with like hey I actually love this temp track I love this smoke this Max Roach track I'm really attached to it I'm kind of in a crisis with it being totally transparent with him how can we um, talk about what the score is doing for me what it's doing for the film emotionally and in terms of the storyline and then what other forms of instrumentation can we use that don't necessarily lose that intention emotionally, but that are elevating it and working with it in a different kind of way. And so we ended up working with strings, and that's how that came to fruition. And um, with with America, um, you know, again, I was going back to like, what does it mean to make a contemporary silent film? And so to be honest with you, I the whole time we were shooting, part of the benefit of shooting a silent film is that you can play any fucking music you want while you're shooting, like crazy music on speakers and it's so fun, which you can never do when you make films normally. And we were listening to Florence Price quite a bit, who I had never heard of. And the last film is dedicated to her, actually. She um, was the first black woman ever to have her music played by a major orchestra in 1925. Um, and so I was like, OK, well, maybe this will work. But then once I started cutting, I wasn't, for some reason, it, it wasn't working and so I really struggled. I was kind of freaking out up until the last like week of like what it should be and then um, I watched um, Isaac Julian's film Looking for Langston um, which I was embarrassed to say I had not seen before and I was so inspired by it and um, it's beautiful and the music is amazing and I noticed that Trevor Matheson had done the score for it, who was a part of the Black Audio Film Collective in the 90s. I happened to be in the UK at the time and found somebody who knew him and I emailed him and he emailed me back and we got together at a cafe and I showed him the film and was like totally nerded out. I can't even believe he even spoke to me, but I was just like, I, I don't know what to do and I think, you know, can you, are you interested in this in any level? And he was like, okay, like, just let me look at the film and I'll get back to you and he called me back a few days later and, um, and agreed to work on it. And he basically, the way he worked was amazing because he put together basically a bunch of different stems, a bunch of different tracks and was like, you know, you can just arrange these, you know, the way you want. I was like, you don't want to cue them or arrange them? He's like, no, you, you got this. And I was like, okay, I don't actually have this. But, and I, then I started working, so Uda Duseja, who does, um, who also works with, um, has worked with Trevor before and John Acomfra, um, he really kind of built out the sound design and worked with Trevor's uh, tracks in a way that essentially created and developed what you're hearing and a lot of that conversation was how do we think about sound design as being um, just as intuitive as music um, and then the bits and pieces of dialogue that you have are brief interviews that came in like really in the last minute um, of, of me asking people actually Alex asked them I wrote out the questions but he like 
took his iPhone and went and asked people, you know, what's the difference to you between America and the United States? If you had to explain America to a person from another planet, how would you describe it? And so then those pieces of dialogue are sort of woven into the sound design. And sometimes they're legible and sometimes they're not. But for me, it was more about a mantra, something that maybe affects you in a more subconscious way that you're not consciously hearing in that moment, but that sticks with you in much the same way that hopefully images do, right? That you may not know what these historical facts are that are being illustrated, but those images are what stay inside of you, like a memory, and, and that that's how we might absorb history, even more so than like a textbook. And not that, I mean, textbooks are important too, but. Um, and then AK was kind of essentially approached the same way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, can I, can I have question? <laughs> um, one more. <laughs> Very short. Okay, no, I'll ask it short. Um, you mentioned you've been talking about America and you know the emphasis for America being that American cinema and black cinema are effectively one and the same. Mm -hmm. and, and I would assume that you feel that way about contemporary cinema now. Mm -hmm. Are there things inside of like con the contemporary landscape of cinema, like American filmmakers, excluding yourself that you're excited about, that you admire, that you think are that don't need correction or course correction that you feel are accurate. Uh, what do you mean accurate or? I guess what I guess what I'm asking is like um, like for example like when somebody asked me about what excites me about cinema, I mentioned Garrett Bradley. Mm. So I'm just I guess I'm wondering you know like what you know outside of yourself you know what are you <laughs> looking at in regards to American cinema that oh. you're thinking is you know what I mean you're, it's, you're not critical of it you're happy about it and it's, it's, mm. it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, um, gosh, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, I think that um, Ramel Ross and, and, uh, is a really great example of somebody who, he's a photographer, um, he teaches, I think, at RISD, um, and his film, Hell County, um, which, which was, ex I mean, really blew people's minds. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of the film, but I'd, I'd highly recommend seeing it. It really is kind of challenging ideas of documentary, of what that is. It's challenging ideas around cinema. It's very much about the black Southern experience. Um, and it's, it's formally challenging. And I think that, you know, for me, it's not so much about what's right and what's wrong. I mean, it's more about um, what new questions are being raised. I think Shireen Nishat is somebody who I've admired for a very, very long time and um, is, you know, just made her first film, I think, that was shot on American land that I think is maybe going to be out to the public sometime soon or is like touring around right now. But when I watch her films, I've, I'm continuously inspired. I think Barry Jenkins is a really good example of somebody who is making work in a mainstream space, um, but, you know, has a real emphasis, I think, and dedication to beauty. Um, in a way that can also be abstract. Um, and someone honest like Ava DuVernay, who maybe is making things that are on very much on the mainstream level, but is doing incredible like shape-shifting work in terms of how the industry is seeing itself and thinking about itself. Um, Arthur Jaffa, I think, is another kind of interesting example of of this blending, Julie Dash, who's, you know, whose film actually, Diary of an African Nun, which I hadn't seen and I highly recommend, it's on YouTube, I think. Um, it's, it's probably one of the most amazing films I've ever seen in my life. It's amazing and it's really short, it's like 10 minutes long. And um, I'd like to see, you know, the new work she's making and if she's developing new things. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, no, you, but. You're answering it in droves, thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Garrett, Thanks. and thank, thank you, you for coming out. Thank you.